Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's webinar, the new FDA draft guidance on in vitro DDI studies, how will it impact you? All lines have been placed on the listen only mode. <coughs> if you should require assistance throughout the conference, please press star zero on your telephone keypad to reach a live operator or use the Q&A box on the lower left-hand side of your screen. At this time, it is my pleasure to turn the floor over to your host, Graham Dick. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you, Angelica. Uh, this is Graham Dick. I lead commercialization at Qualys Transporter Solutions, now a bio-IVT company. We are pleased that you have joined our webinar to discuss the new FDA draft guidance on DDI studies. Uh, we at Qualys provide in vitro hepatic models to help our clients predict the effect of drugs and other compounds on the human liver. In September 2017, we announced that BioReclamation had acquired Qualys. This acquisition expands our ability to offer comprehensive products and services to answer liver-related research questions. BioIVT is a worldwide provider of biological and in vitro products and services to help accelerate drug discovery and development programs. It's my privilege to introduce our speakers. Andrew Parkinson is Chief Executive Officer of XPD Consulting and Adjunct Professor of Pharmacology and Toxicology at the University of Kansas Medical Center. He founded Xenotech in 1994 and left in 2011. He now consults for numerous pharmaceutical companies. We are pleased to partner with Andrew on this webinar. Dr. Ron Latham leads ADMI Research Services at Qualys and has over 20 years experience in ADMI Talks research. His career spans time at QPS Hepatic Biosciences, BD Technologies, and GSK, where he has led project teams investigating SIP, induction, and inhibition issues with lead compounds. He was a founder of Apatotech, a company that was acquired by Cells Direct. Our speakers have prepared remarks that will take about 45 minutes. Uh, we will leave time for questions. As Angelica mentioned, you can type your questions into the Q&A box on your screen. And we will see the questions and ask either Andrew or Ron to respond. And at this time, it's my pleasure to turn the podium over to Andrew. Thank you, Graham. Uh, good morning, everyone, or whatever time zone uh, is appropriate, or greeting is appropriate for your time zone. Um, oops. So I'm going to lead off by perhaps asking a question that at least one of you might have, and that is, why is my boss making me listen to some guy in Kansas City? And I thought I would remind you or maybe inform you that Kansas City is not only home to the Chiefs and the Royals, but it's also home to QT prolongation because uh, back in the 90s when Herc's Baron Roussel was located in the greater Kansas City area, they developed Selvane, the active ingredient terphanidine, uh, which was sort of a blockbuster non-sedating antihistamine, and it would stop your nose running for a day if you took Selvane, but it could stop it running forever if you took Selvane with a C3A inhibitor, such as ketoconazole or erythromycin. And in 1997, actually, uh, the FDA initiated uh, procedures to withdraw Selvane from the market. That actually went into effect in 1998. But that same year, it issued its first EDI guidance for industry on drug-drug interactions. And it largely covered the topic of SIP inhibition, paying particular attention to SIP3A inhibition and metabolism, particularly by SIP3A, as is the case with the Terfenity and 2D6, which was recognized as a genetic polymorphic uh, enzyme. So that's why Kansas City uh, uh, plays a role in all of this. Oops. And I thought I'd start um, sort of way at the beginning and ask the question, so what is a, a relevant pharmacokinetic drug interaction? Well. You can argue that uh, this would be the most conservative definition, and that is that uh, it's significant if it falls outside the bioequivalence goalpost of 80% to 125%. And so if, for example, we have a victim drug in the presence of an, in an inhibitor, we could say at the very uh, least 
that the AUC ratio, which is the AUC ratio of the victim drug in the presence of the inhibitor compared with the AUC in the absence of the inhibitor, was equal or greater than 1.25. That, that may not be uh, truly relevant in the clinic, but uh, it does fall outside the uh, bioequivalence goalpost. And then if we have an inducer, it would be significant if the AUC of the victim drug in the presence of an inducer compared with out the inducer was less than 0.8. And to remind you or inform you that the uh, AUC ratio is equal to the reciprocal of the clearance ratio. And so, for example, the clearance ratio uh, in the presence of an inducer compared with clearance in the absence of an inducer would be 1.25. So we have uh, a, a natural connection between 1.25 and 0.8. Now, I'd like to go back even further than the current guidance document and ask why did the FDA make certain changes in its cutoff values when it went from the 2006 guidance to the 2012 guidance? And if we look at reversible inhibition as an example, in 2006, our ratio was I, which is the in vivo concentration, over KI, which is the in vitro inhibition constant. We didn't have the term R1 back in 2006, but I'm just putting in that to, to relate things. And that ratio uh, of I over KI had to be equal or greater than 0 0.1. But in 2012, they added 1 to the equation. So this became 1 plus I over KI, and the ratio became 1.1. Why did they add the 1? Because 1 plus I over KI is equal to your AUC ratio. You might think, therefore, that the cutoff values for inhibition would be 1.25, and perhaps the cutoff for induction would be 0.8. They're not. And they're not because the cutoff values uh, contained within them uh, a safety factor, as did at the uh, time of the 2012 guidance, the use of total plasma Cmax as a measure of the uh, in vivo concentration of the test drug. I'm going to be talking about the scope, changes in the scope, changes in equations, changes in cutoff values as we go from 2012 to 2017. But before I get started, I just want to take a quick look at some of the things that uh, you need to measure or have information on to interpret these uh, data. So that includes oral dose uh, at the intended clinical dose, of course, plasma Cmax at steady state. You need to know the fraction of unbound drug in plasma, or FUP, and for regulatory purposes, we're not going to be uh, considering anything that uh, has an FUP of less than 0.01 uh, or greater than 99% uh, protein bound. We need to know the unbound plasma Cmax, which is um, a plasma Cmax times FUP. For the 2017 guidance, we need to know the blood to plasma drug concentration ratio, or RB. This is a measure of whether the drug gets from plasma unrestricted into uh, blood cells. If it's restricted, uh, RB will be around about 0.5, same as hematocrit. If it gets in and out freely, RB will be roughly 1. Some drugs get in but can't get out because, for example, they bind very tight to carbonic anhydrase, and those can have RB values of 30 or more all the way up to 250, I think. And then we might either need the fraction of unbound drug in plasma, or we need to know clearance in, uh, in blood versus plasma. That is uh, why we use the RB value. And Andrew, I'm we, sorry to interrupt. If yes. you can just speak a little bit louder, we are having some participants asking you to be a little bit more clear. Ah, OK. Uh, <laughs> I will try. <laughs> um, Thank you. Okay, one of the other parameters you need to know is the maximum hepatic inlet concentration, and that is defined in this particular equation. This is the equation uh, reported in the 2012 FDA guidance, and uh, I'm not going to go, uh, based on the interests of time and the fact you'll have access to these slides afterwards, uh, I'm not going to go through all these definitions. I do want to point out that as we go to 2017, this is where the RB, the, the blood to plasma concentration ratio, uh, comes in. So there was a change in how this uh, fundamental PK parameter is calculated for interpreting the in vitro data. You also need to know 
uh, either by measuring it experimentally or calculating it as you ink, which is the fraction of unbanked test drug in the incubation, for example, the microsomal incubation, and now for induction study, the hepatocyte incubation as well. So, in terms of the equations and the cutoff values, what were they? What are they now? What should they be if you want to enter all this into Excel? And what would they be if the cutoffs were the goalpost values? And the reason I calculate those or look at those is because that gives me an, uh, an indication of what in vitro concentrations uh, I should be shooting for. In 2012, looking at reversible SIP inhibition, we had seven SIP enzymes, 1A2, 2B6, 2C9, 2C8, 2, uh, 2C19, 2D6, and 3A4. There was a recommendation that for 3A4 you measured its activity uh, with two substrates that appears to have disappeared from the latest version. There's an emphasis now on using in vitro substrates that are also good in vivo index substrates. Uh, the FDA has uh, changed uh, probe substrate to index substrate for reasons known only to them. So, for example, you would use midazolam because it's also an index uh, substrate for in vitro studies. And I recommend, this isn't coming from the guidance, that for reversible inhibition studies you use a low protein concentration, 0.1 milligrams per mil or less, a short incubation time around five minutes, for example, because you want to minimize looking at reversible inhibition, the potential for time-dependent inhibition, and you want to minimize depletion of the substrate and the inhibitor. And substrate and inhibitor depletion are mentioned in the 2017 guidance, as things, of course, to be avoided. In 2017, uh, the way we looked at uh, or tried to interpret the in vitro results from a reversible SIP inhibition uh, assay was based on R1, which was 1 plus I, the uh, in vivo concentration over Ki, the inhibitor constant. And that has now changed to 1 plus I max U over Ki. And so we have a change where in 2012 we were basing the in vivo concentration on total plasma Cmax. Now we're basing it on the unbound plasma Cmax. And our cutoff for looking at inhibition of hepatic enzymes was 1.1 back in 2012. It has dropped uh, to 1.02 in 2017. We also have in the gut, intestinal CYP3A, the relevant in vivo concentration is molar dose over 250 mils. And uh, uh, for a reversible inhibition of gut CYP3A, the cutoff was 11 back in 2012. And all of that has stayed the same with the notable exception that we now have the term R1 gut to distinguish it from R1, which applies to the liver. Uh, but the, uh, the equation and the cutoff is the same. So under what conditions does the new equation give exactly the same result as the old one? And I'm not going to take you through the math. I'm just going to come to the conclusion. They are the same when the fraction unbound in plasma is 0.2, which is 80%. So if you have 80%, your old results will, will be the same as your new results. But if your drug is bound less than 80% to plasma protein binding, then an old negative R1 value could now be a positive value. And the good news is that an old positive R1 value may now be a negative value. So things could potentially change depending on the degree of plasma protein binding. So this is the equation we currently have uh, at the top for, uh, for R1. If you wanted to put this in Excel, you would want to put in Cmax at steady state, the fraction unbound in plasma. KI, which should be based on unbound uh, drug concentration, so it should be KI uh, times FU inc. And if you want to uh, estimate KI from IC50 over 2, you would end up with the second equation uh, shown in the Excel. If you wanted to change the cutoffs to the goalpost value of 1.25, you would end up with the equation shown at the bottom, 
where, for example, you have 12 and a half times Cmax times FEP divided by Ki corrected for fraction unbound in the incubation. And I'll show you why I do that later on. Can you reliably estimate Ki by dividing IC50 over 2? Yes. Uh, we have a publication here from uh, the, the, uh, the Xenotech group. Based on 343 experiments, there was uh, a good relationship between experimentally determined Ki values and those estimated from the initial, uh, the initial IC50 experiment divided by 2. With non-competitive inhibitors, you overestimate by a factor of 2, and that's exactly what you would predict uh, from theoretical principles. But actually, this errs on the side of caution, so uh, it's, you're being a little bit more conservative. Uh, if you simply take IT50 over 2 as your measure for, uh, for KI. You can, of course, determine experimentally with a range of uh, substrate concentrations and a range of inhibitor concentrations. And just to note, all these experiments were done with a low protein concentration and a short incubation time. So what do you do if the substrate concentration is not equal to KM? Well, then you use the chang prusoff equation. Uh, and you can see from this equation that if you know IC50, the substrate concentration, and it's Km, you can estimate Ki basically for, for any uh, ratio of substrate to Km. Uh, or, as I mentioned already, you can actually measure the uh, Ki value experimentally. I showed this slide before. We're going to take a look at the last bit to help you understand why I look at these goalpost values. And so I can now ask from the, from the one, uh, uh, the equation shown in the middle where instead of IC50 over 2, I've taken the 2 up to the top. So I have a ratio of 25 times Cmax times FUP divided by IC50 times FU Inc. Uh, when added to 1, gives me my goalpost ratio of 1.25. So this is my con this is my most conservative positive result and it occurs now you have to remember you've got one plus so so it's one plus a quarter so this current ratio is a ratio of the numerator at one and the denom denominator at four so I've got to take that into account and I'm just going to read you basically the outcome of this to reach IC50 in the in vitro incubation the in vitro concentration of inhibitor must be 100 times the unbound plasma Cmax. And that 100 value comes from the factor of 25 shown in the numerator and the fact that this ratio is only 1 fourth, not equal to 1. So I want them to be equal. If I wanted to find the IC50 curve and go up to 90% inhibition, then the in vitro unbound concentration must be 1,000 times the unbound concentration of Cmax. What does that mean? An inhibition curve shown here is largely defined as you go from 10% inhibition to 90% inhibition, and that occurs at 1 tenth and 10 times Km. So if I really wanted to find the curve, I want to go to 10 times my Ki, or uh, realistically 10 times my IC50 value. Well, I say you should go to 100 times and preferably 1,000 times the unbound plasma Cmax in vitro. What does the FDA says, say? It basically says you should go to 50 times. Now, why is there a difference there? I actually think it's because the, the uh, FDA ran through these same calculations, but they weren't trying to get to IC50. I think they were trying to get to KI, which is uh, two times the, the IC or, or half the IC50 value. So I think, actually, uh, we're, we're sort of recommending uh, the same thing. But all of this is largely moot because of what else is in the guidance. And in the guidance, the FDA is basically saying that you should initiate in vitro metabolic studies before first in human studies. And that means you don't know what plasma Cmax is. You still might know what FUP is, but it's not going to do you any good. You won't know what the clinical dose is. So 
you're basically flying blind, and I think you're going to be looking potentially at a four-step process. You're going to run the in vitro studies, then you're going to run the clinical studies, then you may discover you're going to have to repeat the in vitro studies, and this is uh, potentially good news for CROs, and they might actually be worth investing in. Or you could do something like this. You could determine the maximum accuracy of your test drug in inc various in vitro incubation media. And then you could test concentrations in vitro as a percentage of the maximum solubility going through, say, a 1,000-fold range, going from 100% of, of aqueous solubility there to 0.1%. You can't go any higher than that. So if you're going to repeat an in vitro study, you simply can't do it because you need to go higher. That's impossible. You could go lower, but uh, uh, if you've got positive results, there probably won't be any need. So. I think this type of approach will be useful. It does pose a problem perhaps for uh, toxicity with cell-based systems such as the parasites for induction and cell-based systems for some of the transporter studies, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Now let's look at irreversible or time-dependent or metabolism-dependent SIP inhibition. The scope has changed uh, pretty much the way it did with reversible. We have the same uh, seven enzymes to consider, and uh, we're just going to focus on a single substrate, probably midazolam with CYP3A, midazolam or another uh, appropriate index uh, substrate. The basic equation has stayed the same. We're now looking at R2, which is defined as K observed plus K degradation divided by K degradation. A uh, nice simple equation to begin with. K-degradation is the in vivo half-life of the affected cytochrome P450 enzyme. I'm going to show you a table of values on the next page just for information purposes. And K-observed is an in vitro uh, assessment of uh, time-dependent inhibition, which I will show you on the next slide. In 2012, for hepatic SIP enzymes, the cutoff value was 1.1. And for intestinal CYP3A, the cutoff was 11. So 1 plus 0.1, 1 plus 10. As we go to 2017, for hepatic enzymes, the, uh, the cutoff has changed to 1.25. Uh, it's a little more lax. Uh, and we'll see why that change was made in a minute. And uh, interestingly, there is no mention of irreversible inhibition of intestinal CYP3A in the 27 guidance document. And so we don't have, for example, R2 gut, which would be equivalent to R1 gut for reversible inhibition. And I find this kind of interesting. Here's the values of the turnover and half-lives of the SIPs from a, a paper that is cited here. I'm putting that in purely for information purposes. So that takes care of KDAG. What is K-observed? K-observed is a bacchaeus menten type equation that connects k act, which is the maximum rate of SIP inactivation, uh, times uh, plasma CMAX at steady state over KI, the inhibitor concentration supporting half maximal uh, inactivation, plus the uh, uh, steady state uh, plasma CMAX. That has changed. It's still the same format. It's still a michaelis menten type equation. But now our in vivo concentration is the unbound concentration times 50. Uh, so uh, as we go from 2012, we were looking at simply total plasma CMAX. Now we're looking at 50 times unbound plasma CMAX. And remember, we had a slight change in the cutoff. We went from 1.1 to 1.25. Now, I have some questions as I went through the guidance, and one was, is KI, and this is K large I, so small I for reversible inhibition, large I for irreversible inhibition. Is KI for irreversible inhibition based on the nominal or the unbound concentration of test drug? And the FDA doesn't say. It should be based on the unbound concentration. So you would take the nominal concentrations type, uh, times FUE. Just as you would correct K small i, you would correct K large i. But that is not stipulated in the guidance. And is there a nice, simple relationship to compare all R2 values with new ones? No, at least none I could figure out. And if you do discern one, uh, feel free to let me know, please. 
Now the question is, does the FDA describe criteria for evaluating whether a drug, a test drug, causes time-dependent inhibition? Well, y yes and no. This is a statement from the new guidance, and it says any significant time-dependent and cofactor-dependent loss of initial product formation may indicate time-dependent inhibition, which I would uh, say was about as useful as my wife telling me she would like something nice for Christmas. It doesn't really tell me what I, I need to know. It doesn't define what a significant time-dependent uh, loss of, uh, of activity is. We developed our own uh, when I was back at Xenotech. We published this back in 2011. We proposed a cutoff of a 1.5-fold shift in IC50. So following a 30-minute pre-incubation, the IC50 uh, value uh, was lower by a factor of 1.5 than that uh, was a presumptive positive for clinically relevant time-dependent in inhibition. And that would then trigger the need to measure using multiple time points and multiple inhibitor concentrations, uh, K and ACT and KI, so that we could then calculate the R2 value. I'm going to move on to transporters. Uh, you may wonder, uh, if you think the way I do, uh, why isn't the transporter inhibition ratio called R4? And why isn't the cutoff ratio based on 1 plus I over KI? And I don't know. I would have done this for consistency, but uh, I don't work for the FDA. I did want to point out that there are some basic fundamental uh, approaches to what we select as substrate concentrations for in vitro studies. For SIP inhibition, we like the substrate concentration to equal KM because it simplifies estimated KI. It's simply IC50 over 2. For SIP induction, we want the substrate concentration to be much greater than KM because now we're under Vmax conditions and Vmax rates will be proportional to the concentration of SIP enzyme and that's what we're measuring in, in essence when we look for induction. But for transporter inhibition, we want S probably to be much lower than KM. And that's because we want to be at a substrate concentration where uptake of the test drug or the probe substrate or index substrate into vesicles or into cells is largely determined by facilitated transport and only marginally uh, uh, mediated by passive diffusion. As you increase the concentration, passive diffusion increases linearly with concentration, whereas facilitated transport follows michaelis menten kinetics. So, you can, you can arrive at a point at a high concentration of substrate where actually more uptake occurs by, by uh, passive diffusion than facilitated transport. So you want to be on the low substrate concentration range for transported studies. <clears throat> so the scope of the studies back in 2012 for transporter inhibition included two efflux transporters, PGP and BCRP, two hepatic uptake transporters, OATP1B1 and OATP1B3, and three renal uptake transporters, OAT1, OAT3, and OCT2. That number has now increased from seven to nine as we go to 2017 because the FDA is now recommending an evaluation of the bidirectional renal slash hepatic transporters, MATE1 and MATE2K. Um, and also, uh, back in 2012, uh, there was an emphasis on considering inhibition of PGP and BCRP, both in the intestine and the liver. Now we're focusing only on uh, their activity in the intestine, so some of minor change there. There was a procedural change for OATP 1B1 and 1B3. Back in 12, 2012, we were concerned only with direct inhibition. Now we're being asked to, to consider direct inhibition and time-dependent inhibition of these hepatic uptake transporters. And there's a recommendation pretty much across the board, but it was specifically mentioned for transporters, that we use in vivo index or probe substrates for the in vitro assays because there are reports of substrate-dependent inhibition of transporters. Back in 2012, when we were looking at uh, the inhibition of PGP and BCRP, we had a ratio of I over KI, 
we had two I values, uh, and it was either KI or IC50, which is interesting. We had two I values, one for total plasma Cmax, and that was for uh, assessing inhibition of a paddock PGP with a cutoff of 0.1, or we were looking at intestinal PGP and BCRP, and here I2 was motor dose over 250, and we had a cutoff value of 10. We now have dispensed with evaluating hepatic inhibition of these efflux transporters for focusing just on the gut. So the new ratio is I gut, uh, which is motor dose over 250 mils, divided by either KI or IC50, and we have the same intestinal cutoff of 10. So in terms of intestinal transport, uh, efflux transporters, there really is no difference between 2017 and 2012. So let's go through uh, for these transporters, for the efflux transporters, what we did for the reversible hepatic SIP inhibition. And uh, here's the FDA equation. We have dose in micromoles divided by 0 0.25 liters or 250 mils, but I, I want to get uh, micromolar concentrations over divided by my KI or my IC50, and I've got a cutoff of 10. If I want the cutoff to be 1.25 so I can estimate what will be the minimum I need to do uh, for my worst case scenario for a positive result in vitro, this will now be dosed in not 0.25 liters but in 10 uh, liters. And if I want my numerator to equal my denominator, taking into account that uh, right now they're in a 1 to 4 relationship. I come to the conclusion that to reach IC50, the in vitro concentration of inhibitor must be four times molar dose dissolved in 10 microliters, which is the same as dose dissolved in two and a half microliters. If I want to define the whole curve and go up to 90% inhibition, then I'm going to have to go up to dose divided by 0.25 liters. And what does the FDA say about this? Actually, it says the same thing. So uh, my calculations are that you need to go at least a dose over two and a half liters to get to IC50, and uh, the FDA is saying exactly the same thing. So we concur there. <clears throat> Hepatic uptake transporter inhibition. This was a little complicated in 2012 because we were considering, uh, we did this in, in two steps. In step one, we looked at I over KI or I over uh, IC50, and uh, I was total plasma Cmax in steady state. And uh, uh, if that proved positive, then you could see whether you got a negative result by going to a slightly more complicated value, which was called the R value. So we've gone from ratio to R value. And this was bound on the unbound maximum plasma inlet concentration, which back in 2012 was calculated without RB. And our cutoff back then for the second part was 1.25. In 2017, we've dispensed with the first step, which is, I think, a good, uh, good idea. And we've gone to the uh, assessment based on hepatic, maximum hepatic inlet concentration. Uh, this does now have uh, RB built into it, as shown previously on slide 8. And uh, we have a change in cutoff value. Uh, we've gone from 1.25 down to 1.1. <clears throat> so this is the equation we now have. The R value is unbound. The maximum inlet plasma concentration with that RB factor built in, either KI or IC50. And for a positive result, we were at 1.25. Now we're a bit more conservative. We're now at 1.1. So we've lowered the bar. And so it is possible. It's not easy to come up with a simple rule, but it is possible that if you had a, a negative result in the past, it could potentially be positive. You also have to now consider looking at OATP 1B1 and 1B3 inhibition with and without a 30-minute pre-incubation period. And so your methodology is probably out, to, uh, out of date, uh, which sucks. Renal uptake transporter inhibition, OAT1 and 3 and OCT2. This is a nice, simple story. 
because basically there's no change. We're looking at I over KI or IC50 back in 2012. It was based on the unbound plasma CMAX at steady state, and it still is, and the cutoff stayed the same. So that's rather nice and simple. But we've got two newcomers to the party. We must now, uh, or we are recommended to uh, assess inhibition of MATE1 and MATE2K, these bidirectional inhibitors. Uh, we have nothing to compare to back in 2012 because this is a new recommendation. But we're looking at the unbound plasma concentration at steady state divided by IC50. And the, the, the cutoff uh, is going to be 0 0.02, which is, I think, the lowest or I don't think it is the lowest cutoff for any of the transporters. Well, staying with transporters, can I use IC50 or do I have to measure KI? Well, the FDA clearly states you can use IC50 or KI. And I really don't understand why the FDA doesn't recommend converting IC50 to KI values based on the cheng prusov equation. There are several CROs that do this, and I think this is a good practice. Just be aware, you cannot simply estimate KI from IC50 for most transporter studies because the substrate concentration is lower than KM uh, for reasons uh, outlined before. And now, finally, switching to induction. Uh, back in 2012, we were concerned with induction of CYP1A2, 2B6, and 3A4 because these were under the control of three different uh, Xeno sensors. It's a little confusing what we're supposed to do in 2017, but uh, we're going to look at the three enzymes. If we have a positive result for 3A4, we're going to then move on to 2C8, 2C9, and 2C19. Uh, for, and we can use uh, mRNA or activity, but preferably mRNA. So you're either going to do mRNA or both. Uh, there, there are arguments to be made for and against that. Logistically, you're probably going to do this uh, as, a, as a single study and uh, just multiplex uh, the analysis of mRNA for all these enzymes. I will caution you, though, that it's almost a waste of time measuring CYP2C19 mRNA because although CYP2C19 activity is inducible by PXR agonist, mRNA is not. So we have a disconnect here. The test system remains, uh, the test system of choice remains human hepatocytes from three preparations. And we're going to treat the drug possibly for 48 or 72, not just the fixed uh, three-day treatment that we had before. A new recommendation is that you measure test drug concentration in the medium throughout the last day of treatment. The equation for Estimating the clinical significance of induction back in 2012 is shown on the left. It's based on R3, which is uh, which incorporates sort of a michaelis menten type equation where I have Emax times inducer concentration over EC50 plus uh, inducer concentration. And that concentration back in 2012 was based on total plasma Cmax. We have now moved to unbound plasma Cmax and included a safety factor of 10 in the revised equation that appears in the 2017 guidance. Another change is that the R3 cutoff for a positive result went from 0.9 down to equal to or less than 0.8. I do want to point out uh, something that's often lost, that Emax is the induction relative to the control set to zero. Uh, it's not fold increase over the control set to one. So that's a little confusing. You wouldn't do a michaelis menten kinetic plot for, for enzyme kinetic starting at 1, and you shouldn't do it for enzyme induction. So take all of your fold induction, subtract 1, uh, and you'll get the right Emax value. It does affect EC50 values when you have only modest fold induction. There are other approaches described in the guidance for interpreting SIP induction data. Uh, I just want to comment on one of them because I'm not a fan of it, and that is that if your test drug causes more than a two-fold increase in CYP mRNA and the response is at least 20% of the response you see with the positive control, you can, you can interpret that as a positive result which will trigger the need for a clinical drug interaction study. But this uh, doesn't specify at what concentration of drug uh, 
does a two-fold 20% of positive control result uh, become positive? And I think this, this type of interpretation discourages testing the drug at high concentrations. And we're going to want to test the drug at high concentrations in the future because we don't have any clinical data. We don't have plasma C-max because we're doing these studies before the first in humans. So, um, I'm not a big fan of this, uh, this particular interpretation. And speaking of high concentrations, cell toxicity can complicate an infection study. And uh, so the question is, how can the risk of hepatocyte toxicity be minimized so that the test drug can be assessed as an inducer of high concentrations? preferably up to the limit of solubility so that, you know, potentially you don't have to go back and repeat an induction study just because you didn't go high enough. What you don't want to do is use what I call constipated hepatocytes, and this is my term for poorly differentiated or poorly adapted hepatocytes that have little or no efflux transporter on the cannulicular membrane. When you, when you plate hepatocytes, they have to reform biocannuliculi and re-express functional efflux transporters, and this takes time, of course. Anyway, you can minimize the risk by using transporter-certified uh, hepatocytes, such as those that have been pioneered at COS. And in the interest of time, I'm going to stop here. I do have additional slides that will be available to you. They cover a few more aspects of induction, and they also uh, look at what the guidance has to say about assessing the victim potential of your test drug for drug-drug uh, interaction potential. So at this point, I will uh, hand things back over to Ron, I think. Okay, Andrew, thank you very much for that uh, deep dive into the new changes and the latest guidance. I just want to talk a little bit about how some of these changes are going to affect the practical um, development of your drug compound. And so, so uh, I guess the start, as Andrew mentioned, was the very first guidance in 1997. And this was put out by the FDA as kind of a um, just a heads up on what they were thinking about. And it was in response to many uh, adverse events that had started to be reported in the literature in the early 70s. So Andrew mentioned the, uh, in uh, 1990 the terfenidine and uh, ketoconazole story, which was quite tragic and opened a lot of eyes. There was a lot of other drugs that got pulled off the market, um, such as uh, cervastatin and cisapride. And so the guidance stressed the need for carrying out in vitro DDI studies, and basically the concept that in vitro studies could actually eliminate the need for clinical investigations was, was presented here, which was um, pretty good news. This is just a quick overview of the different guidances we've had. We've had four major guidances looking at in vitro DDI studies. Um, they come at different time frames. There was nine years between 97 and 2006, and then six years, and now five years since the last guidance in 2012. And it's important to note that in between the guidances, there was a lot of um, study and papers in the literature that kind of drove the, uh, the prevailing thought of the regulators that, that actually drafted these guidances. And it's important because um, you shouldn't really just rely on the guidances. It's always important to keep track of the literature and the latest trends and what's going on uh, because the regulators will listen to published data and they, they um, will uh, kind of change their mind once in a while if you're persistent and you have a good argument. So, <laughs> um, so actually the big thing that, that came about in this latest guidance is really there's what I call a paradigm shift because now the FDA would like these in vitro DDI studies to be done before your first in human study. So um, this estimated actually actual CMAX. So we're not going to have the actual CMAX values anymore to kind of guide or put our in vitro data into context for what might be happening in vivo. So that's going to affect the way that we approach our studies. So right now, um, from the 2017 guidance, this is what the FDA suggests that we run, which means this is what we actually have to run. So our SIP ID studies reaction phenotyping, uh, and this isn't just SIP, so if we've done a good job screening out uh, SIP metabolism, we have to identify any enzymes that might be involved. 
So these are the studies that the FDA likes us to run right now, um, basically a summary of what Andrew just presented. So how does this affect drug development? Well, in the old days, <laughs> which is right now, um, a lot of the stuff that we were talking about, the CIP inhibition induction, the CIP ID, the transporter work, um, substrate and inhibition studies, they were pretty much done not just here, but all over the continuum. Some people did them before their INDs, some after, but now the FDA is kind of suggesting that we ship them all before our first time in human, which would be, you know, before the IND. So that's a pretty big change because we rely on the Cmax value to put the in vitro data in context, and now we're not going to have that. So one of the consequences is we're going to have a greater reliance on the in vitro data, which means we need to design our, our studies better, inhibition, induction, transporter studies, and we need to make sure that that data is human relevant because if we're doing the in vitro studies and it's not relevant, we're going to run into the situation that Andrew showed on slide 22 that, um, you know, you do the in vitro study, do the clinical study, and then back to the in vitro, and we want to avoid that. So you want to make sure your systems are physiologically relevant, and an example of that is what uh, Andrew mentioned earlier with our transporter certified hepatocytes. Um, if you do an induction study with these hepatocytes, there's a lot more processes going on than just SIP induction. There's metabolism and transport. So, uh, yeah. So we want to make sure the data that we generate is relevant to the in vivo situation, and it's going to be more important than ever now if we don't have a Cmax value to relate our in vitro data. So basically what we're, we're recommending from, from Qualys is taking a more holistic approach to everything, including everything down to the initial screening, which isn't really relevant to today's uh, talk, but the part right here with the SIP ID or the metabolic enzyme ID, inhibition, induction, our definitive studies and our transporter studies. We need to look at these in total and not just individually. I think a lot of companies will be uh, trying to develop a drug and all of a sudden they'll come down after their clinical study and say, oh, wait, we need to, to check the induction box, so let's go out and find someone to do an induction study and run that. I think it's more effective, especially now, if we can run these all in a block and at the same place so that the data from one study can be used to put contact data from another study in context. So I think this is going to be really important. And also mechanistic studies for follow-up work I think might be more important than ever now, especially if there's some miscues on the in vitro data that you have and you find some things that were unexpected or unanticipated in your clinical trial, you have some questions to answer for the FDA. Um, and one example of this me mechanistic work is the disposition work that we do using the B-Clear technology, which can answer a lot of questions that uh, may have crept up in the clinic for you. So basically our process at QPS is, again, a holistic approach. We look at the objectives of your program, things like your exit strategy, you know, how far you want to take it, your budget, your timelines, assess all the data that you have currently, whether it be in-house from CROs or from the company you in-license from, do a detailed gap analysis on that and prioritize things that should be done to get you in the right place for the regulatory authorities and to get you toward your goal. Carry out those in vitro studies for you. Um, do those all in um, F, uh, FDA compliant manner. Do the data analysis and finally deliver the report for you, which has the interpretation and everything you need for your filing. We, we, uh, we can address some questions right now and our speakers can stay here uh, past the end of the hour. Um, you do see the contact information up here on the screen, and you can shoot an email out to Ron Latham, Ron Latham at Bioreclamation IVT, or to me, Graham Dick, G. Dick at Bioreclamation IVT. Um, just looking through some of these questions, and I know there's a question about will, will the slides be available? The answer is yes, they will be available, as well as a video. Of, um, of the webinar, and we'll send that link out to everyone who has joined, um, and um, we'll, we'll have that out within a few days. Um, there's, a, there's a question here from Snow. If we have both KI and IC50 values, which value should we use to calculate the ratio? FDA only listed IC50 in the most, if not all, racial calculation equations in the 2017 guidance. Uh, Andrew, do you want to take that one? Yeah, you should use KI and and uh, go one step further. You should 
to correct it for the fraction unbound, so you should be using KI unbound uh, whenever possible. Um, another question here. Um, in terms of concentrations to be tested for gut DDIs, would you recommend limiting the theoretical gut lumen concentration to a maximal solubility in bio-relevant fluids such as FASSIF or FESSIF? Um, Andrew? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, given the fact that you won't know what your dose is uh, going forward, I think I would still argue that my default is going to be uh, testing this at the maximum aqueous solubility for both PGP and BCRP inhibition and for for C3A uh, uh, inhibition. Um, you know, what we haven't touched upon is that all these interpretations are based on the static model. And essentially what the static model is saying is that the in vivo concentrations that we're coming up with, such as dose over 250 mils or plasma Cmax or unbound plasma Cmax, stay constant. Uh, they, they don't change from one dose to the next. And uh, when you do the SimSip or Satira or the Simulation Plus PBK modeling, uh, you can, you can uh, potentially uh, adjust your estimates for the need to perform clinical studies. So I think given that we don't have uh, first in human data going forward, uh, We'll, we'll still push for high aqueous solubility, uh, make that our, our top concentration. And if then we want to, to consider uh, real-world uh, concentrations, that's where maybe the PPK modeling will, will come in and, and be useful. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, here's another question uh, from Pushpa. Um, and this is Directed to you, Andrew, Dr. Parkinson, could you comment on why the new guidance for induction studies mentions measurement of concentration of unbound test drug in hepatocytes? Well, it's hard to argue against doing that because we're basing uh, everything we do with SIP inhibition and uh, transporter inhibition uh, on the unbound concentration. and. And uh, when you look at the literature, for example, just KI values for, for SIP inhibition, they vary enormously, you know, thousands of fold because people are not taking into account the unbound concentration of inhibitor in the test system. And uh, we haven't done that for the longest time with hepatocytes, and, and it's time we did. But it's complicated because it's not a single, it's potentially not a single value. And I touch upon this in some of the extra slides. Uh, it's going to change over time um, or potentially change over time. So it's not clear exactly what in vitro concentration we will be basing this on. Um, but yes, uh, uh, we already had this in the EMA guidance document going back to 2012 where they were recommending measuring the concentration of test drug in the incubation throughout the last 24-hour treatment period. Um, but EMA then, like the FDA today, they're not really telling us exactly how to use that information. Uh, what I am concerned about is that is that people will do inappropriate things to maintain a high concentration close to the nominal concentration throughout, such as, for example, increasing the volume of the incubation medium, which would then starve the hepatocytes of oxygen, or uh, making lots of changes uh, to the medium, uh, maybe twice a day or three times a day. And we have some unpublished data that actually shows that if you change the medium more than what, if you change the medium more frequently, it can actually increase C3A activity 
and and almost mimic induction. So uh, I don't know if that's true for for all test systems, but uh, we're sort of going into uncharted territory if we start fussing with uh, changing the medium more than once every 24 hours. It's going to take us into some unknown period. But I do think it's a good idea. Uh, I think we should have been doing it for the longest time. Uh, but it's still not quite clear how we go about doing that. Um, thank you. Um, another question. We have quite a few more, and we'll just continue with these questions uh, so long as people are on the line. Uh, this is from Yong. Isn't the recommendation on conducting in vitro DDI tests before first in man, this is from line 78 to 80, limited to CYP? Um, well, that's, where, that's where it's stated, but the general tone of statements elsewhere is that we want we want these data for SIP inhibition, SIP induction, and with SIP induction you can carry that over to PGP induction if it's positive, and for transporter inhibition, so that we will know whether to uh, uh, exclude or include people in future clinical studies. So it's, it's and and whether we will have potentially other special populations uh, to consider, uh, such as you know, genetic polymorphisms, such as people with uh, hepatic impairment or renal impairment. So, so the idea is to gather as much in vitro information about DDI liabilities from a victim, from a perpetrator potential, and then that will impact on the design uh, and the information we collect from clinical studies. So it's specifically mentioned in the SIP induction study, but statements otherwise lead me to believe that, that this is applicable to all of the um, DDI studies. Thank you. Um, just continuing on here from Chris. Would you expect to see time-dependent inhibition of OATPs even in a transfected cell line, a non-hepatocyte cell line? I, 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 I'm, I can't think of the paper, but I'm pretty sure it's been shown in both test systems. So, so uh, that's right. Yeah, yeah I, it, it should show up in both. Yep. Okay. Um, from, this looks like Joy. Um, for transporter studies, if a substrate is highly permeable and passive diffusion is expected to predominate, wouldn't using a low substrate concentration to evaluate active transport create an artificial environment that potentially overestimates the role of active transport in substrate disposition? Well, that's a great question. And when you, when you consider a drug like propranolol, one of the first sort of modern drugs developed, it is so highly permeable that when you look at the pharmacokinetics of intravenously propranolol, you don't simply see an alpha and a beta phase. You actually see a, a third phase that is so short and it represents distribution into highly perfused tissues, followed by distribution into moderately perfused tissue followed by your beta elimination phase, which is, which is uh, metabolic elimination. And yet, for panelol, there's an OCT1 substrate. You only can detect it in the nanomolar range, but, you, but it would qualify as an OCT1 substrate. So you have this, this issue that you could, you could possibly identify the role of an uptake transporter in the uptake of drugs like propranolol that we would consider to have such high rates of passive diffusion that we don't have to be concerned about uh, um, OCT. And in fact, the fact that propranolol is an OCT1 substrate is completely irrelevant because passive diffusion, uh, you know, will, will get it into cells and uh, particularly into the liver anyway. So, uh, but that said, it does point to the important principle that when you evaluate a test drug, 
as an inhibitor of transporters, you want to go as high as possible. And when you evaluate it at a, as a substrate, you do want to make sure that you go as low as possible. And in the EMA, for example, they're recommending a 100-fold range of concentrations that, that bracket uh, Cmax or unbound uh, Cmax. So, so you do want to get low, but uh, uh, so yes, it, it it can show up positive if if you go long enough for 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 highly permeable compounds, and they don't they don't get much more permeable than propranolol which is typically used as a positive control for a high permeability drug in HCO2 uh, monolayers. So, yeah, good question. Okay, thank you. Um, from John, is the 2017 FDA guidance harmonized with EMA? No. Uh, <laughs> watch the space. We don't even know when the, when the revised EMA guidance is coming out. Uh, uh, they they don't have it on their calendar to be released, uh, but you uh, the the harmonization process has begun. So uh, I don't want to define it as catch up, but but uh, the 2017 FDA guidance looks a lot more like the 2012 uh, uh, EMA guidance. So I, I I think they've already started coming together. So unless the EMA goes off on a completely different tangent, which I don't think it will, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be pretty close to being harmonized soon. So we have a couple of questions from VJ. I'll read both of them. Um, if your substrate concentration in the transporter inhibition study is the same, can we use the chang kusov equation? So that's question one. And then question two is, how do you proceed with compounds which are potent inhibitors for CYP isozymes while performing induction studies? What concentrations will be ideal to start or proceed, uh, whether lower than IC50 or else or anywhere or elsewhere? Uh, anywhere, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, on the first one, yes, you, you can use the Cheng proofs off. Uh, you're you're basically assuming that uh, you have competitive inhibition when you use the equation that I sh showed on uh, slide 17. Um, you, when, you, when, you, when you estimate uh, Ki as IC50 over 2 when S is equal to Km, you're actually using the Cheng prusov equation because that's the relationship that comes out. Uh, as you as your substrate concentration is uh, falls below Km, IC50 and Ki get progressively closer, which is possibly why the FDA is saying you can use either IC50 or Ki. It doesn't specify that, but I'm guessing where that, that that's where it's coming from. But yeah, I think if you if you stipulate that you're assuming that you can use the uh, cheng prusov equation to go from IC50 to Ki, and if you've conducted your in vitro experiment at, uh, and uh, appropriately, then yeah, I, I uh, based on past experience, that will be acceptable uh, to the FDA. And uh, as for using. Uh, um, inhibitors, uh, particularly irreversible inhibitors as inducers, this really was the whole basis for putting the emphasis of measuring mRNA for SIP induction studies because there are, there are many, many uh, irreversible inhibitors that uh, are also inducers. And of course in the clinic, uh, you, you've got this query, will induction offset uh, inhibition, and there are examples where that occurs uh, with Tadalafil uh, or Cialis. Uh, it's both an irreversible 3A inhibitor and it's a 3A inducer, and Tadalis or Tadalafil has no impact on nifedipine pharmacokinetics, so that can offset. But what the real, where the real lesson comes from is that if your irreversible uh, inhibitor induces CYP3A uh, mRNA, it's probably going to be inducing uh, 2C8 
2C9, 2C19, uh, even 2D6. 2D6 actually is an inducible enzyme. Uh, it's just the pharmacogenetics sort of overshadow that, but, but that will go up as well. Uh, 2D6 will go up. So it's these other enzymes that aren't also inhibited that, that uh, are a concern. And that was the emphasis, I think, for, uh, for putting the emphasis on changes in mRNA level. Um, okay. Um, from Suzanne, is the IC50 shift and the drug with FU is uh, not 0 0.001, can I consider a 20-fold difference? Um, well, to be candid, I'm not quite sure what what the question is 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 asked. Is is this FU Inc or FUB? If if Suzanne could could restate the question, then yep. expand Sounds on that good. a little bit. Um, yeah. From from Jason, um, is there a discussion? Is, is there a discussion on the measured concentration versus nominal concentration, or is it totally up to the sponsor how to present the data and make a scientific <laughs> argument? Well, I wish the FDA would include in their equations, uh, for example, don't just call it KI or IC50 call it KIU for unbound or IC50U for, for unbound. Um, it, it really would, and the same for the EMA, it would be so helpful if, if this were done. For reversible inhibition, there is a specific statement that says it should be based on the unbound concentration. There is no such statement for, for irreversible inhibition but neither is there a statement saying, you know, not to do it. And um, so we know from the fact that there is that a lot of the variation in published KI, both for reversible and irreversible inhibition, a lot of that variation comes from the fact that people are using very different protein concentrations. And and uh, those, those, some of those differences pretty much disappear when you correct for FU Inc, the unbound fraction. So uh, in some cases they do specify, in other cases they don't. But I think, I think in this day and age, we know two things: in vivo concentrations should be bar should be based on unbound plasma concentration, and in vitro concentrations should be banned, should be based on the unbound concentration. So. Okay. So, uh, yeah. From um, Ashwani, uh, what is FU INC value and goalpost equation mean? Or I guess what does the FU um, value and goalpost value, value uh, equation mean? Um, yeah. Well, F, I mean, FU Inc is the fraction of drug unbound in the incubation. And uh, uh, FU ink values in microsomes, for example, will get progressively lower as you increase the concentration of protein. And uh, two drugs incubated with microsomes at the same protein concentration could have different FU ink values because one may partition into the membrane more than others. And this can be estimated, uh, or the degree of binding can be estimated from the physical chemical properties of the drugs and we use log P for basic and non-ionized drugs, and uh, we use log D at pH 7.4 for acidic and zwitterionic drugs. Um, what was the second part of that question? <laughs> I guess the goalpost <laughs> equation. I mean, I'm, and I'm just going to. Uh, we have a couple more questions, and we will we will get to that. And I see Suzanne, you have clarified your question. We'll get to that. I. Just want to say for people who are still on, and we appreciate you staying past the end of the hour. Um, we at Qualys, now BioIVT, will be delighted to uh, set up um, a meeting with you individually, and you can talk to our experts about your specific uh, needs and goals with with your drug discovery and development program. Our partnership with Andrew allows us to to bring him into these discussions as well, if, if that would be valuable. So. Um,
Um, Suzanne, we will get to your question. Uh, I want to um, address this one from Sanya. Um, what is the concentration in the media at the end of the incubation study going to be used? Or I'm sorry, where? Where is the concentration in the media at the end of the incubation study induction. going to be used? I'm sorry, induction. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. <laughs> induction study going to be used. Yeah, I mean, I think I think this is something that will have to be done on a on a case by case basis. Um, uh, you will you will want to measure the concentration of your test drug uh, in the medium throughout the the last twenty four hour treatment period. There's nothing in the guidance to that, that recommends how many time points you should look at uh, and and how to use those those data, uh, whether you're using uh, an average uh, over the uh, over time. Um, um, so I think it could very well be at the end of the day that you're going to have to look at uh, uh, your uh, best case and worst case scenario and see if those give you different results. Uh, so if you base it on the lowest observed concentration and you got a negative and you base it on the highest observed concentration and you got a positive, that would be the time to, to consider maybe looking at uh, whether modeling will will give you uh, a clear answer. Okay, uh, just a couple more questions here uh, from Amy. For OATP inhibition, what is the difference of DDI risk between direct inhibition and TDI, a time dependent? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, I think what it will possibly, uh, well, uh, let me first say I'm not an expert on TDI of transporters. Uh, I'm, I'm comfortable navigating the TDI SIP world, but, but not the transporter world. Um, and so when we, when we look at uh, TDI of SIPs, uh, we basically know that the uh, inhibition will probably occur very quickly, it will persist after the drug has been discontinued in accordance with the half-life of the affected SIP enzyme. And I'm sorry to say, I don't know enough about the mechanism of the time-dependent inhibition of OATBs and the time period for recovery. Uh, if I don't know if it's covalent binding. I don't know if it's involution of the transporter, so it disappears from the path of the membrane and then can reappear. I don't know what the time course of that is. So uh, all I know is that if you do uh, this in vitro with a 30-minute incubation, you'll get an IC50 value that you could uh, change to a KI value with the cheng prusov equation put it into the equation, if it's positive, I think there's a high likelihood that you'll be doing a clinical interaction study where you're dosing with a clinical dose and then coming in with a probe, uh, an index substrate to look for uh, clinically relevant OATP inhibition. So. Okay, um, and we will uh, we'll have this final um, clarification question from Suzanne. Um, the F found is 99.5%. Can a 20-fold difference is considered as extensive TDI? Hang on. Where? <laughs> okay. Yes, the fraction, the fraction bound is 99.5%. Can a 20-fold difference? considered as extensive TDI. So, um, if, if, yeah, I, if, if need, I'm in If we yeah, need more ahead. clarification on that, um, Suzanne, that's something we would be, we'd be happy to, to follow up uh, offline and, and we, can, we can discuss that in more detail. Yeah. 
Um, I, I, I want to uh, bring the webinar to a close. Uh, thank you, Andrew, uh, for your comments and for Ron. Um, and I thank everyone who has joined us uh, globally. We have a global audience here. Thank you for persevering through our technical difficulties. Uh, we will be, we have recorded this webinar. We will be uh, posting the link and we will send everyone who has joined us, we'll send you a, a, a link to where we've posted uh, the webinar and we'll also be sending out slides. So, uh, but in the meantime, um, again, you see our contact information there. Uh, you can reach out to Ron Latham directly, R. Latham at Bioreclamation IVT. You can reach out to me, Graham Dick, G D Y C K at Bioreclamation IVT. Um, you can also visit us at uh, www.qualis.com um, and you can go to our contact us form and send us a note. If you send us a note there, I will get your email and uh, we'll be pleased to continue uh, the discussion. And at this point, uh, we'll, well, we'll bring this to a close and I'll turn it back over to Angelica. Thank you. This does conclude today's webinar. We thank you for your, pay, for your participation. You may disconnect your lines at this time.